So today uh, we'll be talking about the network of genomic enabled learning health systems. Before we get started, I would like to recognize the team here that has been working on this to bring the SNOFO um, to publication um, and wanted to thank them. Um, this team will be working on the application uh, with the applicants and also be working through the applicant process and review process. So to get started, I just want to go through a quick overview over the overall talk so you know where we're going with this is first, we'll actually talk about the purpose of the genomic learning health system, um, NOFO. We'll go through some definitions. We'll also go through an overview of the, the funding announcement. We'll, do, we'll provide a little bit of specific information about NCI's institute specific interest. We'll go through the eligibility criteria. Um, we'll talk about some important dates, and then we'll get into questions and answers. So the purpose um, of this uh, funding announcement is what, something that NHGRI recognized was a key gap in genomic medicine, which is that, um, that key gap is actually um, taking the transition um, into clinical practice, a lot of the evidence that has been generated in genomics. So this purpose of this NOFO is to form a network of genomic-enabled learning health systems to work together to improve the approaches for integration of genomic information. And the important point is a virtuous learning health system cycle of implementation, evaluation, refinement, and implementation. So we wanted to, we know that many of you on this call are actually familiar with what a learning health system is, but we thought it would be for this uh, funding announcement to go through the definition of how we're seeing it for this NOFO. We recognize um, that a fundamental hallmark of a learning health system lies in the capacity to seamlessly incorporate evidence-based interventions into clinical practice. The important part is that this integration entails a continuous collection of data from the healthcare providers and patient, which essentially allows us to pivot and process adjustments aim at enhancing medical care through the wider adoption of evidence practices. We do recognize that a key feature of this is a close monitoring of outcomes to facilitate real-time adjustments, ensure, ensuring that the achievement of the anticipated results. Uh, this approach will revolve around a virtuous cycle of consistently implementing enhancements and then rigorously assessing their impact on patient outcomes. We recognize that there's many examples of learning health systems that are used to adopt a wide range of healthcare needs. That we just used a few examples here, whether it's palliative care and end-stage liver disease or testing and delabeling patients that have are reported with a penicillin allergy. And another one is balanced crystalloids versus um, to reduce adverse kidney events um, in critically ill patients. So we want to go through a few definitions that are included in the NOFO, but to go through the ones that are relevant to this discussion. One is a genomic medicine intervention. And again, this pertains to evidence-based clinical care initiatives. And I think the important part is there's evidence, uh, they're evidence-based initiatives that leverage genomics to enhance patient outcomes. And these projects will be selected for implementation due to their proven effectiveness. And we included a few examples here. They could be as, uh, as broad as in incorporating or using electronic health records to identify individuals that carry a pathogenic variant to also uh, genome sequencing for critically ill infants. And we recognize that there are many more. Um, the other definition here is genomic medicine implementation strategy. We refer this to how an intervention will be implemented and scaled to multiple healthcare environments. One of the key things of this uh, no, NOFO is to advance the adoption of genomic learning health system. So this could include things such as educational models or modules, EHR provided clinical decision support, checklist, or formulary, and we recognize there's many others. We do, we defined a virtuous learning health system cycle is that iterative process to encompassing implementation, evaluation, refinement, and then re-implementation. And the idea with this is a framework that health, healthcare stakeholders deliver evidence-based interventions while concurrently learning to enhance care delivery through that continuous feedback loop that we talk about in learning health systems. So this slide is to kind of give you an idea in terms of where the focus of this is. As you can see here on red, this is a, on the subway chart in red here is really uh, uh, studies that actually we've supported that actually look at efficacy. And then here in yellow is some studies that we look at in terms of effectiveness. This NOFO was intended as, a, as highlighted in the green here to establish a network 
to develop and refine genomic learning um, health system approaches using an implementation science framework, um, really with the goal to um, help with the adoption of genomics into clinical care using uh, by doing qualitative and quantitative research and measure the impact. I think the one thing that's important we recognize with this NOFO is that we do need to make it possible to essentially have near automated low resource ways of measuring outcomes to be successful. So what are the gaps addressed by this initiative? We recognize that there's been a slow uptake of several evidence-based genomic medicine interventions. Many of these people on this call will be familiar that there are uh, multiple conditions, whether it's actual conditions for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome. Um, there's also time-sensitive genome sequencing in critically ill infants and pharmacogenomic testing, again, are just some examples of things that have been slow to uptake. And really, this is intended to, to take those areas where there's effective ev there's evidence that they should be more broadly adopted. Um, we also recognize that there's a limited incorporation of genomics into learning health systems. We've actually looked at what NIH does support, which is plenty of learning health systems, but there really is a paucity of genomics incorporated into those learning health system models. We recognize there's a need for improved exchange of genomic information across the health systems. We see in some of our studies that in order to include people in studies, that one of the challenges is that, as we know, patients get their healthcare in multiple settings, and it's important for that information to be able to track with them. And we also, this last part is we recognize there's really no resources out there for genomic learning health system approaches, tools, and resources. And so one of the key products of this, this effort is really to actually make these more broadly available so other institutions can adopt a genomic learning health system. So the objective here is to establish a network of institutions with a track record of using genomic learning health system approaches in their health system. We do expect in, in, including in resource limited uh, communities, the, the idea is that they'll ref, will refine and develop these practices into implementation resources. You will notice that we identify two to four network-wide implementation projects, and the idea of that is really to check the robustness of the genomic learning health system, but and to use those to kind of uh, understand these tools and resources to make them more broadly available for other sites to implement. So just to talk a, a very briefly about institute-specific interests, as you'll recognize the, on this bullet list here, many of these are we've already talked about, but I think the one thing that is unique that N, uh, NCI has brought up is tumor sequencing as one. So really the program structure, the plan is to fund this over five years. We have issued two U01 uh, NOFOs um, uh, with a single coordinating center and then four to six clinical sites. Again, the project plan in year one is the network is to share their learning health system implementation practices and identify really those that are suitable for cross-network implementation. In years two through four, the idea is the network will actually select and implement two to four genomic medicine intervention projects. And then year five will really define, develop these and refine these, um, the genomic learning health system strategies as resources that can be used to broadly adopt for other institutions to adopt um, genomics into their health system, including in low resource settings. The funding is 5.3 million over five years for a total of 26.2 million. So eligibility criteria, I think this is very straightforward. The, I think the most important point is that is not eligible. We're not allowing non-domestic, non-US entities to apply. And then just really to provide some important dates, the open date that for the earliest submission of an application is October 6th of this year. The letter of intent is also due, but notice this is optional. It does help us when you do submit this to kind of help us plan for review um, and planning how many applications we have to manage. The application due date is November 7th of 2023 at 5 p.m., your local time of your applicant organization. We do anticipate funding this in August of 2024. I'm gonna move on to some questions and answers. I think one of the questions that we've heard consistently is why does this meet NIH definition of clinical trial? Well, one important point to recognize is NIH expanded its definition in 2015 of what a clinical trial is, just going through what the criteria are. It does involve human participants. It prospectively assigns um, pr these participants to an intervention. It evaluates the effect of the intervention and monitors biomedical or behavioral outcome. 
I think that it's very important to make the point though, the primary focus of this endeavor is quality improvement. We do recognize that some interventions may meet the NIH definition of clinical trials and the, and the application should thus meet the clinical trial application requirements. We, I have put these in this slide here in terms of what is the significance of being a clinical trial. I think the first thing is the application evaluated is based on, is based, the application is evaluated based on specific clinical trial criteria, which is linked out here. And then that, some other things is a, the, uh, the network will have to register anything that is deemed a clinical trial with clinicaltrials.gov. This is usually done by the coordinating center. Uh, the grantees must, you must ensure that you have good clinical uh, uh, practice training for all the clinical investigators that are involved with this. Um, the next point is a principal investor must set a human subjects and clinical trials information form. It's important to note that we are anticipating this not to be, to be a delayed onset human subject research. And the reason is, is we will not have, we're not expecting a protocol at the time of submission, but we will need to get we will need to have this, um, the protocol submitted to us for review and approval before we start. The principal investigator must also submit updates using the human subject system, and the principal investigator will also have to post the clinical trial informed consent. Again, this is usually done by the coordinating center if it's a network-wide uh, protocol. Um, and the lastly, the network will need to submit a single IRB if we are doing the same study across multiple sites. So now I'm gonna just step through a few of the questions that we've received. Um, what are the key aspects of a learning health system that need to be in place for this NOFO? Really that you should just in, uh, demonstrate that your organization has adopted a learning health system approach that is committed to the real-time collection of data from patient encounters. And it's really related to that intervention. And then really the ability to rapidly adjust or make changes based on those findings. And we really do are hoping to a nearly automated means for doing this, just recognizing that it's very difficult to capture um, data manually. The next one was what level of detail of statistical analysis should applicants provide for the proposed pilot projects? We're, we are really thinking of two areas. There's um, two aspects of this will require measurement. There's one, the adoption of genomic intervention, and there's also the varying effectiveness of different interventions when they are adopted. And we're just anticipating that you will define what will constitute a meaningful impact for the, your, the proposed intervention and outline your analytical strategy for assessing both adoption and effectiveness. Um, you should also include the power of your proposed uh, design to detect meaningful outcomes. Um, does my research strategy need to adhere to the 12 page limit? The short answer is yes. Um, how conceptually distinct do the proposed implementation interventions need to be? We are encouraging you to offer a diverse array of implementation interventions that are substantiated by the most robust existing evidence. Uh, really with the imperative to suggest that the evidence should have broader adoption within the health systems to enhance patient care. We're really leaving it up to you as the applicants to discern and describe distinctions among the proposed projects and justify why more than one conceptually related project is needed. Um, do applicants need to have a learning health system in place to apply? The answer is yes. We recognize there's a significant amount of effort and time that it takes to establish a learning health system. And so given the uh, funding announcement and the funding period, we recognize that this will be important to be um, established um, at the time of award. But does your institution have to have genomics? We reckon already incorporated into your learning health system. No, we do expect you to demonstrate that you have the capacity and expertise to implement genomics into your existing learning health system. And then will sites be able to work implementation interventions that are not selected by the steering committee? The focus will be on these implementation interventions that are selected by the network with um, recognizing that the funding is uh, limited and is provided for this NOFO for these uh, site-wide um, implementation projects. You are welcome to implement and share site-specific interventions and products using your own resources, but these must be a secondary priority to the network-wide implementation. What is meant by having an active partner in the investigative team? We think this is a very important point. We recognize that not all health systems actually have learning health systems, but the intention here is actually to have investigators that are in your community and preferably from underserved communities 
that don't have a learning health system in place. And the idea is they can work from the beginning as a, a, a co-investigator to work with us as we select um, different things that should be implemented to help us adjust what we're implementing, but also the intent is at the end that these individuals could go back to their institution and broadly share the genomic learning health system approach. And that's all the questions I have. Um, again, just a reminder that this is recorded and it will be available for viewing on the website. Again, give us a week to get that to you. If you do have any questions, you can email me at this email here. And the FAQs, we will continually or consistently and regularly update those, um, but there will no, be no announcements in terms of when that's done. We have provided the link to the uh, two NOFOs that have been published here at the bottom for the clinical sites and the coordinating center. And that's all I have, and we can take any questions. Hi, Rob. So there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first question we got are, are health economics-based outcomes mandatory? Um, their health economics outcomes are, are not mandatory, no. The next question we have are, um, is um, does the genomic data sharing policy apply to all applicants, even if we're not collecting new genomic information from participants as part of the project? Yes, you will have to submit, um, as part of the new data management sharing policy, you will need to uh, submit a data sharing policy plan or your plan, and that will have to be reviewed. Um, another question we got is how should CS applicants budget for years two to five, given that it is not known which projects will be chosen? Yeah, so, so with that question, you know, the, the we've outlined in terms of what that budget will be um, for the network, and everyone will have the same constraints or the same budget to work within. Once all these projects are provided by the network and the steering committee is going to have to consider the financial parts of that and whether it's it's feasible to implement at all the sites. I think that answers the next question as well is should clinical site applications budget for two to three pilots or one pilot project. Um, and then the next question we have is how many examples should we have of both of tools and resources we are prepared to share with the network. Well, I, I, I think there's a couple of things with that. I, I in terms of tools and resources, the expectation is that you should use some examples of what tools and resources you would develop in terms of specifically saying that you have certain tools to share at the time. The idea is, I guess, if you could use an example, if we used hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, you might have some tools to be able to do that. And you could say that that's why you're choosing this project because or this is one of the projects is because you have these tools and resources available for implementation as, a, as, as opposed to being very specific about how many you have. Sure. Um, before I go on, I believe Catherine Nathanson has her hand raised. Um, Catherine, are you able to um, ask your question? Um, I, I am. I have actually a few I, questions. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. So one of our questions has been, um, how do we manage the investigators on the project? So for example, I'm giving hypothetical, we propose a pharmacogenetics project. We have a pharmacogenetics person in funded and has effort on the grant. No pharmacogenetics project is selected by the um, by the um, consortium. And so now do we, like we have someone who's like, I just am unsure about how but for example, we can pull in a neurologist. We didn't propose a neurology project. We don't have a neurology person with effort, but we could pull them in and then give them effort. Like, I just am unsure about how we propose other than sort of the PIs, the investigators who would be the clinical champions for the various implementation science projects because we don't know what will be selected by the group. Yeah, so we've done this in the past, too, is where we have sites actually propose, um, you know, what they think is the best. Of course, you know, this will go to the steering committee. The steering committee will make a final decision on what those are. As a result of that, you're right, there might be some individuals that don't necessarily meet the criteria 
are, are needed, as you used an example, pharmacogenomics, and maybe you do need a neurologist to kind of help. The, the idea would be is you could, you could reallocate your budget to support the people that you would think to need to um, adopt that certain um, intervention. Um, and so that's something you can do once it starts. And Terry, I see that you came on. Do you want to? I, I did. Yeah. And thanks for that for that question and that answer. I, I agree, Rob. I, I think also um, in, in your application, you may want to consider budgeting based on what you're proposing as your two to three projects um, and, and have it make the most sense for, for your proposal, recognizing that that may not be a proposal that goes forward. So if, if you're thinking of something that's that might be a little bit extreme in one direction or another that that might be a constraint on you um, to you know to to try to describe and then to rebudget in the future. But we we will allow rebudgeting. Obviously, we'll want to talk about it, especially if they're like an MPI or or something like that. So so I think we can we can allow flexibility, but do propose what what you include in your application um, for your budget. They should match. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, I had a, a second question. Um, which is how do we deal with the fact that different institutions are at different levels of implementation of genomic medicine? And I'll give an example. So for example, at our institution, um, we have really all our pancreatic cancer patients are getting genetic testing um, routinely, but that may mm -hmm. not be true at many other institutions. And so um, how are you guys thinking about when you have really differential implementation of genomic medicine and projects are proposed where one institution like already has something in place and they're already doing it, but multiple other institutions don't? I I'm just sort of thinking out loud about how, how do you think about that particular issue? I, I think there's two parts I would say with that. Number one is if you come in with that as one of your proposed projects, you're kind of going to be the condition lead expert in terms of that and probably further along. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's helpful. I, I think the idea would be is hopefully by bringing these other institutions, you can improve your process, but at the same time help the others move along. That being said, there's two other, if, if we select three, there's two other projects that you might not be an expert in. So I, hopefully they balance out and those will have to be things that we consider when we actually select, when the steering committee selects those conditions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like there's several more uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, I believe that uh, this, uh, these few questions answered one of the previous questions about um, asking if some of the sites may not be able to implement some projects. For example, a children's hospital may not be able to implement a project involving adults. Um, so is there anything more you'd like to say on that? Yeah, I, I think I would go back to, I mean, the, the steering committee is going to, depending on who's funded and what resources are available, that's going to have to be part of the calculus in terms of whether we choose a different, um, one of these uh, network-wide implementation projects. And Rob, if I could just add, I, I think sure. you know, the, the goal here really is to do genomic medicine writ large or broadly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and during negotiations and discussing with potential awardees, we, we need to understand, you know, what's, what are the limits on your capacity uh, or, or, you know, what, what kind of constraints are you working with? And, and if you're working with, we can only do, you know, 12 to 18 year olds, that may be a, a major consideration and as it probably would be in review as well uh, as to, as to, you know, the, the value of that compared to others. So, so we would encourage you to be as flexible as possible and, um, have multiple sites in the in the group that you're trying. Remember, this is a it's a health system. It's not just a single single institution. So so really trying to uh, to get be as broad as as you can. Um, the next question is: Can grant funding be directed to pay for genetic testing expenses? Yeah. So uh, there's there's two parts. It, it has to be very limited, and the justification would have to be clear. The intention, really, with this um, announcement, is not to fund genetic testing, since we are. I mean, the idea is to implement um, things that have evidence, and we know that insurance doesn't always cover those. But I think you'd have to make a strong argument for why you would want genetic testing done. Um, 
Okay, thank you. And um, the next question is, given the requirement for community stakeholders to be external to the applying institution, do you anticipate using a subcontract to add those stakeholders as investigators? The short answer is yes. We really do want to incorporate them as early as possible so that they can be part of the team and, you know, really help define what um, requirements are for development, but also be part of the process so they adopt the approach. Yeah, Robin, and given that, you know, whether it's a subcontract or some other kind of arrangements yeah. that you make, that's up to you as to yeah. how you do it. But, but the you know, the goal, as Rob said, is to have them involved from the beginning and throughout. Okay, go ahead, Genevieve. Sorry. Um, so I think one of the um, attendees said that uh, they think that there are potentially funds available for sequencing. And could you elaborate on that a little bit? In terms of funds for sequencing, I mean, I, I mean, I think you, what you'd have to do is, I mean, here's an example. If you recommended whole genome sequencing, as you know, that that's probably a significant cost that would not be minimal based on our current budget. But again, if 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 it has evidence to support its implementation, we hope <laughs> that you know the insurance covers this as part of uh, part of care. It's just the idea that it hasn't been more broadly adopted is really what we're focused on with this is really to de develop the genomic learning health systems to adopt, um, you know, the approach. But if there is need for it, I think you just have to include that in your application and explain why you think that needs to be covered as part of your application. In recognizing that, that that's gonna be a significant drain on the resources of other sites that may not be, be doing that, so again, that might go into both selection of initial awardees and selection of projects. But you know, sequencing can be applied to a single gene as well. So it doesn't have to be a whole genome. Thank you. The next question is, um, what are the expectations for the coordinating center specific to this opportunity? In terms, I, I, um, I guess I'm not real clear in terms of that question other than just answer. I mean, the coordinating center really is responsible um, for coordinating the meetings during, we have work group meetings that are weekly. Um, we'll also, there's a process that is probably unfamiliar to many, but a process of actually identifying what tools and resources and what intervention projects are each site has compiling that and helping the network kind of think through that to come up with those projects. Um, once the projects are implemented, I mean, there's things, if it is decided that it's a clinical trial, they would be responsible for submitting the single IRB. Um, they would be responsible for also, you know, ensuring that we're reaching our milestones as a network whole. Each side is responsible for their own effort, but um, really coordinating that effort. And then there's this, the end is really kind of at the, the project is really sharing the resources. And really, um, we'd expect the coordinating center to come up with a strategy in terms of how they plan to do that and coordinating the meetings with those individuals or those groups that they think that could help broadly um, share the information. And, and Rob, you, you did this very well from, from memory. <laughs> so, so I would, would refer the questioner, the, the responsibilities really are, are very clearly outlined in the RFA um, and, and, you know, far be it from us to try to remember them all, but there are seven of them that are listed just above the, the research approach that have to do with, as Rob said, you know, collecting, contributing to, harmonizing the shared strategies, et cetera, assuring and ensuring, assur assessing and ensuring quality of data. I mean, there's, there are several of them there. So I'm not sure we can do much better on this call than, than what's in the RFA. Uh, uh, Johnny B, I think you skipped one on uh, is human subjects protocol required? Oh, my apologies. Yes. Um, is a human subjects protocol required is one of the questions. It, it is. Um, just to background on that, is, is you understand that sites interpret whether this is a quality improvement versus clinical trial. There will be human subjects involved. We know that for sure. So it is human subjects research. Whether it's a clinical trial is the other question that we don't necessarily know from the outset. So that's why we are having people follow the clinical trial application guidelines that are outlined in that slide. 
Thank you. Um, the next question is, do you believe the data sharing plan will be a concern for health systems? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it, it probably knowing, um, working with attorneys in terms of working through that, I think there will always be some questions, whether it's an issue, a big issue is yet to be determined. And, and I think in, in fairness, you know, where there are legitimate concerns, we may be able to work with them, um, but the, the data sharing policy is really pretty firm. Institutions are learning to live with them. Um, and if your institution can't, this may not be the best RFA for you. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is this NOFO focused on adult onset diseases? If pediatric sites can apply, how would they be integrated with adult sites given the diseases are different? Yeah, so th they would really, this is, the idea is the network would actually select those um, two to four different intervention projects. We are expecting that it could go the um, lifespan, but we'd leave that up to the sites to decide. If, if your focus is only on uh, pediatrics, I think it would be very difficult um, without some other partner that could help you implement in adult sites. Thank you. And I think in, in fairness, but you know, vice versa. I mean, we're, yeah. we're really talking about, you know, health systems treat humans. Um, and so so one that's that's specialized in a given area, again, this may not be the best uh, RFA for them. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how will this network complement other existing NHGRI consortiums such as Emerge or Ignite? Yeah, so that's a great question. The, the, that subway chart intention was really to kind of uh, address this a little bit. So I would um, suggest if you look at that, uh, you, NHGRI has supported a lot of efforts to generate evidence about genomics and also has developed a lot of tools. The gap that we really see with this is that taking those tools and also that evidence and putting it into practice. Um, the idea is to take that next step in terms of the spectrum of research to actually do the implementation science to get these things into clinical practice, as opposed to those are really focused a lot of the time looking at effectiveness or if, whether something's effective. Um, so it's really at the end of that spectrum of research. Thank you. Um, the next question is a clarification. The attendees asking um, if the investigators in each application should include a network of four to six GLHSs. Um, is that correct? That is correct. Um, so I, I think there are a couple of interpretations to, to that, Rob. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, so it sounds like this person is asking, should each application come in with four to six GLHSs so that we end up with 30 GLHSs? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, it, it's the, the entire network will be four to six clinical sites and one coordinating center. Right. And each clinical site could be a, a single you know, large comprehensive health system, or it could be, you know, multiple that have gained together to, to address some of the constraints that might be on a single hospital or, or a single health system. Um, but I hope that answers that person's question. Thank you. Um, the next question is, will NCI fund one single cancer only site, or will it fund a project or projects that might be implemented across the consortium? Uh, we haven't finalized that, but the, in, the initial plan is that what this is one network and the idea is that we'll have two to three projects and one of those will have, to, I mean, the ones that they would support would be focused on cancer. Um, so it'd be incorporated. It wouldn't be a separate effort. Right. And, and maybe I could just, just elaborate a, a little bit. So, mm -hmm. so if, if a cancer project is selected, everybody would do it. That's the, the ideal. Um, how NCI's money might get 
allocated may be that they will just fund one center as because that's the easiest way for them to get money to the program. But that wouldn't mean that that there would be one site doing only cancer and nothing else and none of the other sites do cancer. Right. So it's just a way of spreading of, of using that money to offset the cost of the program. But as Rob said, the goal is for all of the sites to do all of the interventions that have been implementations that have been um, uh, agreed upon by the network, including if, if one has chosen a cancer uh, project. Thank you. Um, the next question is, should we demonstrate collaborative links with other LHCSs who are applying for this funding opportunity? I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that it's learning health systems. The C is, yeah, yeah, just so with that in mind, I think it's always helpful to show that you've actually worked with other learning health systems. Again, one of the uh, key kind of large strategic goal with this is to advance the, the number of sites that actually have genomic learning health systems. So I, I wouldn't suggest you don't, but I don't think it's a requirement. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, the budget for the NCI and NHGRI are different. How are you suggesting that we manage that issue? Um, I, I, I guess I would say this is, it's, I would just, it's one application and then how those are funded in the end will actually NHGRI and NCI will work on that. So I don't, I don't think that should change your application. Right. No, I, I agree. And really, you know, please try to focus on the funding for each site, which I believe um, we may have said I'm looking forward in the RFA. Um, but but uh, yeah, so we don't really say that it's just uh, support four to six sites and then um, five years to support a clinical site. So I think you can estimate that the 650 total per year total costs. Uh, that's estimated for one clinical site is is probably about the budget that you should be aiming for. Uh, and don't worry about whether it's cancer or not or who the money comes from or anything like that. This is going to be one program. Hope that helps, Kate. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, is it possible for the coordinating center applicants to be considered as a clinical site if they're not selected as a coordinating center? I, the short answer to that is you couldn't like repurpose the application. Um, you could, but a site could actually have an application come in as a clinical site and could come in as a coordinating center. It would have to be different investigators. And, um, but you couldn't repurpose, I mean, you couldn't, expect to have a coordinating center application be considered as a clinical site if it's not awarded. Thank you. And I think along similar lines, the next question is, do you allow more than one application from a large institution? Uh, knowing the size of some health systems, I would say yes, you could come in. I, I think it would probably be wise to actually talk with them and strategize why they would need to come in as separate. Versus I think also because of the need, you know, this is a big country and a small program, it would be highly unlikely for NHGRI or NCI to award two sites to a single or make two awards to a single institution for the, you know, for essentially the same work in the, in the clinical sites. So, so think about that carefully as well. I mean, you, anybody can apply, um, but, but do give that some consideration. Thank you. Um, the next question is from someone who has not previously participated in a U01 grant. Um, they're asking, does each application include a group of four to six GLHSs that investigators have assembled given that you are looking to fund five applications? Does that mean each application that includes four to six sites will receive 5.3 over five is so about one point Oh, 06 million divided between them. Um, the only thing with the math is you have five divided by the total budget and you got to remember the 5.3 also includes the coordinating center. 
And also keep in mind, it's not each application has to include four to six sites. It could include, could include 10 sites or two or one, uh, as long as it can cover the, the waterfront. So hopefully that's not confusion from the previous question. And, and how you divide up the budget is, is up to you. Thank you. Um, and then the next question is, how should we understand the fact that NCI's budget is different, 650K versus 450K, since NCI funded sites are full and equal members and expected to participate in all projects? That's something we do on a regular basis, just to explain, I mean, how NCI comes in to support this. Um, I guess one simple way to look at it is there's a pool of funds that we will distribute among the sites um, and how much each institute contributes, but that will have to be worked out later. Yeah, I think actually the questioner is confused between total and direct costs. So, so there's 650 per year total costs, 450 per year direct costs. Does that Thank help? You. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, sir. I couldn't see that. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, the next question is, can you speak to the expectation for sharing patient level genomic data outside our health system for other health systems and providers to be able to use, or should we focus on sharing within our health system alone? Uh, the, the answer is both. We, we, our hope is that, um, that within your system, you improve the sharing of your genomic data, but also the intention is to actually come up with ways that it can be shared between different health systems too. Right, so, so not just focusing on sharing within your own system, um, hoping to, to move forward with the health, health information exchange idea of, uh, that has been very effective regionally in, in making electronic medical records transportable and, and care more efficient uh, across different sites. So, so that's the expectation here is that we would move to that. Obviously there are obstacles to that that, that we would want the network to, uh, to address. Thank you. And I think this is the last question is returning to a prior question. Um, they said that Terry mentioned anticipating a budget of 650K, but according to the NHGRI notice, awards are limited to 450K per year direct. If the budget limits for NHGRI and NCI are different, it seems we'll have to direct our proposals to one funder or the other. Is that correct? Or would you like to expand on that? Right, so 650 is total, 450 is direct. Hopefully that, that clarifies it. Thank you. And I believe that's all the questions we have in the Q&A, although um, attendees are free to add questions or to raise their hands if they would like to ask something. And, and while people are thinking about, I would, would just mention that these are our estimates on the, the direct versus the total because every institution has a different um, uh, indirect rate, et cetera. So, um, so, you know, you can pick which one you want, to, you want to go with, depending on what your indirect rate is. Uh, but those are the, the ballparks that we're aiming for. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, again, uh, please go to the website that has our FAQs. We will update those as we um, get new questions that come in and look forward to seeing your application. And Rob, you're, you're always welcome, or you're always open to, to questions directly to you. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And, and then those, when, when we answer those, we'll make those answers uh, available to everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.